Thanks, Roy. Um, I recently hit the age of uh, 50, and uh, I guess, well, most of me did, not quite all of me, but it's uh, thin on top. So, uh, I'm looking back really at the last uh, 28 years as an engineer and five years before that as an apprentice and thinking, okay, where have we come from and uh, how has the industry changed and how has engineering changed? And one of the things I was thinking about was how do I introduce this? And I think uh, for me, I'm in a fairly unique position at the moment. Uh, I'm an engineer, uh, engineering's on the up. I'm in the rail industry. The rail industry is in demand at the moment in a different place to where it was when I first started. And uh, I'm in manufacturing, and people are starting to appreciate what manufacturing is and its importance to the country. Uh, importance to the country. So it's quite a unique position and a unique time for me. And I think for all of us in here, in particular, both those of us that are in manufacturing in the room, there's quite a few of us around. The other thing that's happening is uh, the world's changed, and computing's come and, uh, and brought itself with a whole load of new capabilities that we didn't have when I first started. It's given us the ability that means that we don't actually necessarily need to fire chickens through air engines anymore because we can simulate what a chicken does when it goes through a turbine blade or through a band blade and what uh, the dynamic impact that's going to be. But back in the, uh, the 80s, we just had to try it uh, in a uh, realistic environment first. But I guess one of the things that I, uh, I noticed when I came into the rail, just picking up what Roy has just said, was that um, we, when we're in aerospace, we took everything, we tested everything, we have 10 engines of each type, we do 10 tests, we do 100 different tests before we ever uh, put something into service. And the concept that we'd have a tilting wagon and put a, a, a panel on it and take a risk that it wouldn't work when it went out on the track for the first time, to me was really quite a foreign concept. And something that I just am adamant about, that we shouldn't be testing things live on the railway without doing more virtual uh, proving first. <coughs> So things are changing, uh, things have changed at a technical level, things have changed in lean. I am, and I've got a plaque to prove it from the modular team when I left, saying I'm fanatical about waste. And lean has moved on, so in the last 28 years, I mean, lean was still being decoded into books in the, uh, in the 80s, and then it became the Toyota production system, it became a whole lot of other stuff that went into uh, aerospace where I was working, and then we took in telecoms, and now it's right across construction. And the most forward-looking companies are really adopting it on a wide scale. But um, we've got a lot to learn from automotive. And particularly in uh, Progress Rail at the moment, we, we're doing a lot of work to try and learn from our uh, mothership, a Caterpillar, which has got a Caterpillar production system, a version of the Toyota production system. And we've got a lot to learn as an industry that I think we can share. And it's not just applicable in a manufacturing plant, but it's applicable on track. So, Come and have a look and see what we do. Come and listen to what we do, and, um, and see how it's applicable in your workplace. And I've had a few uh, a few comments. I think someone's going to come and see me uh, later on to kind of uh, talk about that. But uh, continuous improvement and lean that need to be endemic in everything we do. For continuous improvement and for, for engineering to work as an engineering subject, it's essential that everyone knows what each other does. So. What do manufacturers do? How do we do it? And we've also got, we'll talk about some questions I've got for the future that maybe some of you can help with. But if not now, then later on. The traditional view of manufacturing is very much like this. And uh, in some respects, it still is in certain areas. Old fashioned machines, uh, lack of computing, slide rules, logarithmic tables for those of you that uh, might remember uh, the old days and a lot of trial and error. So we'd make stuff, see if we could uh, achieve the tolerances, make it again until we got it right. So there was a lot of skill required and a lot of that trial and error, and it was quite a difficult place to work. We also got a, we sort of moved on this from that, and we started to get a process going in design, procurement, manufacture, assembly. So we had a process, but it felt a bit like everyone was in their compartment. So manufacturers knew what they did, but other people didn't really know what happened. They threw a design in, and bits came out, and if they were wrong, they all fell out, and there was a bit of a bun fight about that. There was a lack of learning. And lean manufacturing and modern techniques mean we need to integrate our thinking more than that, because there was a lack of learning, a lack of feedback, and it was hellish frustrating as an engineer. At a commercial level, it, it involves long lead times, a lot of waste, a lot of quality problems, and a lot of cost. 
what we're really striving for, I think, and it's not just uh, this is not just a progress rail thing. This is a general industry thing. Is an engineered product. I um, I do have a sense of humour, failure when people start to talk about uh, our products as jobbing shops and jobs that are blacksmith. It's an engineered product. It needs to be treated like an engineered product, and we need to be looking at reducing lead times, improving its quality, and sorting out life cycle cost and really understanding life cycle cost. If you treat the product. Uh, that we produce as a commodity and order something expect that it's just going to arrive, it's going to be right and not in, it's going to improve on its own, that won't work. You have to feed it more information in and we've got to get better to engineer the product to make it a better one. For that to happen, obviously everyone needs to understand our capability. What do we do? What we're capable of doing? What we're not capable of doing? But also involve us early. We need to get that early involvement so we can influence the design before it gets too frozen, say, and we need information as early as possible at the front end of the process, but we need other information from the back end of the process too. So rather than that sequential model where it gets thrown over the fence at each stage, <coughs> this is the model that we're really aspiring to and that we need to work to. So the white area in the middle is manufacturing stage. So we've got design, procurement, that same process down the, the bottom there. But we've got involvement, so manufacturers getting involved in the early stages, getting involved, giving some influence, but also being involved in installation, involved in maintenance, <coughs> understanding what's going on. There's a big principle within Lean, and it's about go and see. You don't sit there in an office in a hierarchical situation waiting for someone to come and give you a report saying, this is happened, boss, what should I do? That's not the way it works. That might happen initially, but then you go, you take that, you go, get the team around you, look at the problem, understand it, and really understand what is going on, and then make the decisions based on data. It's a key principle for manufacturing and lean. I think uh, Ian talked about this, the levels of design and the, uh, the sort of hierarchy of design. From scheme design down to layout design, manufacturing drawings, component drawings. I guess people know that we're somewhere down in the bottom of this tree and this is where the progress rail and the, and the other manufacturers are. And yes we are, but we also do some work above that for other customers outside of the UK as well. But one of the key things, and one of the key things that I learned on Modular, was that actually the system is much bigger than that. You've got handling systems. If you're going to make stuff and then handle it safely and not disturb the factory built integrity, You've got to think about those handling systems at the design stage. You've got to have transport systems that work and, and retain that uh, integrity, lifting systems, installation systems, and maintenance systems. It's a bigger system than just manufacturing, and we need to be part of that as much as anyone else. On the right-hand side, it's about people. People make this stuff. The people, are, they get it wrong if they're not using teamwork to get stuff done efficiently then all the efficiencies we've built in at the front end, all that potential about modular and everything else gets lost at the back end if we've still got teams turning up that aren't organised or don't know how the product's going to arrive. Or it's packaged wrong and it's not in a, an easy fashion to be able to manipulate on site. Formula One teams, lead planning and skills, they're all part of this system. And if something changes in the middle of this, a component changes, I don't know, maybe like a new stretcher bar arrives, it changes the whole system. So we've got to go and check it. Potentially, does it change installation, transportation, the training, the lifting, the handling? What does it do? And how that's pulled together? Fairly itself, obviously, we make the stretcher rods. Hopefully, uh, we're going to be making it later this year. The uh, machines are coming in now. And um, those, we also assemble them into layouts. So we need to be part of that. We can contribute to the design and the thinking around design for uh, assembly. I use a term called uh, design for X. I guess it's something I've pinched from aerospace. Uh, when I say X, I mean design for manufacturability, assemble, uh, for transportation, installation, maintenance, uh, although we're not quite there yet, about how we recycle or remove this from service. We can <coughs> contribute to that. We can contribute to design for X. And we need to be invited into that front end, and we'd like you to be invited in too into our operation. It needs to be a fluid operation, a fluid team working. <laughs> but we also need service data. We've seen from SinSin's work today, the massive amount of data that's out there 
that really doesn't come to us in an organised fashion. It, we need that sort of Pareto analysis. What are the failures and how can we then think about those in the context of what we've got to do in manufacture? Because some of those things could be down to the way we're packaging stuff and sending it out to site. Some of it could be down to the way we're lifting it before we put it on the tilting wagons. Multiple points of failure, but we need to understand this. So what's our uh, process and our capability and our tool sets? Because uh, we're moving from just the machine tools, if you like, to these uh, computing tools. Our process overall is something like this. So we've got our, I'm going to use the laser. I bought this at the weekend, I've been dying to use it. So I'm just going to give it a quick. So up here you've got in-house design. We can do in-house design, which we'll do for clients across the world, in uh, South America, Australia, wherever. We also get designs from the client in the UK. And we bring those in and do some manufacturing design and process engineering. So that's where we convert it into manufacturing drawings and programs that go into the machines. And then they go into manufacture with the components and obviously out to assembly and all the way to produce these overall units. So that's our high level process if you like. As part of that process, in this in-house design box here, uh, we use a structured process for new product introduction. So in the same way that you've got a product that gets approved within the track for use for trains to run over it, we have to make sure that we can repeatedly produce that within our factories. That's as important for us as it is to uh, you guys as the clients, uh, many of you, in the performance of that product. We've got to prove we can do it, we can do it efficiently, and we can do it repeatedly, and we've got the process control. So we use a new product introduction process, and we're starting to adopt more automotive thinking in that, with more gated processes and more rigour, more like I guess I'm used to from the aerospace industry, where you prove everything before you get uh, into production. When you get into this design for X, and you're starting to look for uh, clash detection, you're starting to look at how you're going to design safety in, uh, the human factors, can you assemble this without getting your knuckles taken off every time you, you try and tighten something up? how it all comes together, the logic of how it fits, both within our factory, in the assembly areas, but also out on site and during maintenance as well. So this is the sort of level of detail we're getting into at the manufacturing level. And I don't know whether that's sort of common knowledge, but this is the sort of thing that we're doing within our factory, the sort of capability that we've got. We're not just a factory producing steel bits <coughs> and assembling them and sending them out the door. As part of our assurance, we do final element analysis. As I said, we're not just doing work for Network Rail, so we can't rely on uh, the likes of Simpsons work for all of our work. We've got to do it ourselves as well for the clients. So we'll do final element analysis over here. You can see the uh, checking, again, it's this virtual thing about doing it before you get into service. And the same with the castings as well, looking for stress raises and trying to optimise the product. This is quite interesting to see how this, uh, this is actually moving. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but it's actually showing how a casting, uh, as it, the metal pours into it, uh, it actually does a fluid dynamics modelling of the flow of molten metal into the pattern and then how it cools uh, to actually check and see where there's going to be stress raises, where there might be turbulence as the, the metal's pouring into the casting, and that causes voids that then either need machining out or cutting out and welding before it comes out, or worse, they just get scrapped. And the whole process is trying to minimise the amount of um, sort of tinkering that has to go on, welding, grinding, or whatever, after the process, because that's just inherently not good quality. So we do that modelling, and we've got uh, processes that actually now are tuning that, so it's actually simulated real life, and you're starting to tune the metallurgy within our system with the capabilities of models like this. And we're using that on a daily basis in our uh, casting facilities. It just means that things are done uh, right first time. And these casting uh, patterns could cost £30,000 a go. So you don't want to be doing too many of those because uh, your profit margins really get hit hard if you start to do that by trial and error. So this visualisation sort of software really helps us. Picking up on Simpson's work, and uh, similar because Simpson's doing work with Huddersfield, you can see here with modelling how the wheels roll through the, uh, the crossings. And this is taking us into a different place. And I have to say, when we start to see the work that Huddersfield are doing and Simpson's doing, it makes me as an engineer think completely differently because 
I'll be honest, when, when I joined Progress Rail about 15 months ago, everything I was looking at was looking down from the wheel saying, how can we stop the train destroying the S&C and, and how is it behaving with the steel and the ballast and the concrete and everything below? Um, and this is making me think more about, well, what are we doing to the vehicle dynamics, which really is our ultimate objective, is to give that the best path through, uh, through the network. So optimising, not just looking down, but looking up and looking at the vehicle dynamics, that's where the future is going. And as a manufacturer, we can't just concentrate on our bits. We need to be looking at that wider system and understanding it and working with Sinsin and uh, the research establishments to, to develop those techniques. So, going to this next stage now, so I was in the design front end. In process engineering, we're producing 2D CAD uh, drawings, 3D. Uh, we're also adapting routing systems. So we've got a big process line, a big factory. Sometimes you have to route things through it differently. So we've got to balance that up, adapt the routings for different products and different clients. Somewhat different things on their uh, S&C. At the parametric end, but what this is about is producing programs for machine tools. So we take the CAD drawing and we translate it into a program that goes into the CNC machines, which Ian put in, by the way, so I'm just going to link to that one, because Ian did a lot of work on this, obviously, when he worked at, uh, at our factories in the past. So those machines, uh, um, you could do that. Each time you could do them individually, bespoke. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to produce families of programs. And by dialing in parameters, then you can tweak those to act in the same way you do a parametric design. You can tweak it so you're getting the repeatability and the, you're building the knowledge, building on the knowledge you've developed by testing one piece and minimising the risk, minimising the lead times and minimising the bill of materials that you've got at the back end of the process. So that's the sort of thing we're doing with 3D CAD and uh, with parametric programming. <coughs> So then we need to check it. Now in the past, what we've probably done is stick a piece of metal on and machine the hell out of it and just see what happens. But now you can see, let me go back on that one. You can see here, let me get this working, right, how we can simulate the cutters going through the metal and then we can actually check it in reality with uh, real cutters on real metal. Now this uh, might seem a little bit over the top, but actually keeping production going to be able to do this trial and error within the computer is a big deal. Certainly in aerospace, we have issues where the machines were that complicated and that we were asking to do uh, such compl complex things, they would actually even try and machine through themselves without using this sort of software to check and see what was going to happen. And you can see as we get more complex uh, shapes and more complex capability that uh, we need to be doing that checking um, to, prove the, to prove the products. So what do we need uh, at this stage in process engineering? Well, um, when I talk to the guys, one of the key things is I need as much advance notice as possible. And uh, they need to lock down the designs. We get a lot of churn. I think being in manufacturing, uh, after working in network rail, I, I, uh, I'm really surprised. Uh, you know, I started off in, uh, as Roy said, I, I worked on modular uh, for, the, for the last three years. But I was in network rail for five and a half years. And the first year, I worked in possession planning. So when I left possession planning, I had this, this concept that actually we planned the possessions three and a half years out. Uh, we booked all the work in, we got all the work sites set, and we gradually worked it through. And within the last year, everything was set, and we just pressed the button and we just go out there. But actually being on the other side now and seeing what happens, it's not quite as simple as that. Or, and it's not quite as uh, logical, and the timescale seems to be slightly different. But, uh, I, I really am surprised at the amount of late projects coming through. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. And to be honest, it's great fun to firefight into to meet timescales, but um, there's a limit to the efficiency behind that, if I can put it tactfully. So um, there's, there are lots of opportunities there to, to do a, a, a better job on the planning. The alternative is that if you imagine the, the factory is just a, a pipe, and if we've got to tool up for the peaks of taking on those panics when they might hit a sudden surge in, say, July for an August push on the tracks, you know, that, that having a, a pipe that's, that can cope with that capacity is an expensive pipe to have. And to be honest, it's quite a tough, uh, tough thing when you, you're scaling your workforce backwards and forwards 
to cope with that because at a personal level that can be difficult to my voice. It can be quite difficult to keep resizing your staff uh, to cope with that. So the better we can get at sizing that pipe and the better we can get at giving that uh, certainty, uh, the better for all of us. And I have to say that you know, the relationship with, we're getting with NDS to give us that forward visibility now is giving us, uh, certainly for Network Rail Work Bank, it's given us a great, a great forward window. So um, what that does is allows us to do things a lot leaner and it also allows us to raise issues timely with you rather than making assumptions and then trying to engineer that uh, through the system. So um, manufacturing processes. Um, this is our, I don't know if this translates up there, but I'll just use my uh, brand new uh, laser printer thing in me. So uh, we've got six main facilities, and one that I can't talk about that Roy just talked about. So uh, the one I can't talk about is here. Um, South Queen's Ferry is where we cast uh, the, the manganese for the crossings. We've got San Diego where the rail comes in, it's, uh, and I'll show you some of the in a sec. Uh, Midland Foundry where we produce the base plates. And Darlington, where we fabricate overhead lines, uh, overhead line stanchions, and uh, buffer stops. But really, what I want to do first is to go talk about what happens in the cast manganese area. So I've got some uh, videos here. Now, um, casting manganese is critical. It relies on some critical things. First thing is you've got to have a good method. You've got to have a, uh, a good, clean uh, steel and you've got to have a clean mould. If you don't get those right, you can get a tiny particle of sand, the whole cast casting can be ruined, you get voiding within it. So I'm going to show you what I think is one of the, if not the best foundry in the world, it's pretty close to it, um, in uh, South Queensferry, in, uh, up near the uh, road bridge on the fourth. This is a pattern, a uh, wooden pattern, and these are produced in modular format. Uh, most of them, some of them are hand fettled afterwards. Then we produce uh, the moulding from that, from sand. And you can see here uh, the mould top goes on. And then we, we take it, we uh, produce a specific metallurgy that's related to the, the type of rail and its application. The metallurgy is specific to that application. And that's a seven ton ladle with a bottom feed, which means the slag floats to the top and the clean metal drops into the mould down there. This is coming out about 1050 centigrade from the furnace and getting quenched. And it has to be quenched within about five minutes, I think, uh, within an 800 ton tank of cold water uh, to stop precipitation of the, uh, the graphite within it. So this is, if we do a lot on this, in this aftercast area, then we've failed. Um, that's where the, uh, the welding and grinding is done to fix any issues and taking the burrs off. And then it goes through to CNC machining and it comes out as a finished unit. We do, uh, it's Jerry doing a bit of inspection down there for those that uh, don't know Jerry yet. But uh, what we can do is, if anyone wants to come and see how we do this, uh, we've got a, a plant up there where we can actually show you the plant. It's got a lecture theatre, you can learn about the metallurgy and everything else. But I'd recommend if you get a chance, come and have a look at that facility. It's uh, it's amazing. So, San Diego is where we produce the uh, the rail. Uh, the rail comes in. Um, I'm going to teach granny stuff, okay? So hopefully uh, this will be of interest. But it's, uh, it comes in, it goes into CNC cutting machines, and um, then it will get drilled, and then it gets pressed to shape. And all this now is CNC control. So the programming I spoke about is all done here. Gets machined uh, to machine the profiles in. And uh, the next shot shows where we, we're doing parallel machining. So we can actually, you know, effectively double the output of the machine by machining back to back. We've still got some uh, mini machines that Ian was uh, working on phasing out, and they are going to be going soon, I assure you. So uh, we're moving to CNC. And then we've got other things where we'll do uh, electroslag welding of the Vs. And this is a uh, quite interesting operation where it's hooked up into the, uh, the gods. And then the welding is run down into the V. We're feeding that in. Okay, so then we've got uh, flashbot welding. So you'll see this potentially on track. 
but actually do it within the facilities to obviously join all the metals together before they then go out to uh, the assembly yard. So all that's done in-house within the facilities. So then all, that, uh, all the bits and pieces, the manganese and the rails go out to Beeston, uh, the assembly yard. They're laid <coughs> out on the assemblies here. And uh, this is a modern version, I guess, of what we saw on the previous uh, uh, 19, whatever it was, uh, grey matter. So this is where we start to use lasers on site. Um, you can still see the odd string line there because uh, some of our clients still like to see a bit of string being used rather than a laser, uh, which is quaint but uh, interesting for an aerospace engineer to watch. So, uh, the, uh, and you can see there the tilting wagons in the background. And um, we also fit the point operating equipment and set that up. And you can see things being strapped down, ready to go out on the tilters. And uh, Andy's going to take you through uh, and show you what happens with that when it arrives at site uh, later on in the next <coughs> presentation. <coughs> okay, so let's sequence run. You can see the splice there. What we were doing on those as well is we were cutting the panels at our site. So uh, before the, the bearers came in with the split, we were actually uh, sawing them and putting the shrouds on to zip them up before they went on the tilting wagons and out. Okay. So what I'm trying to get over here is that it's a it's really an integrated way of working. Uh, we do produce big bits of steel and we attach concrete to it and we send them out, but it's not just <coughs> manufacturing. We've got that capability to do the design, to model it and to optimize it. But involve us in that so that we can do the best job for the business and the industry. Uh, we've got two and D -D 3D CAD systems and parametric modelling, and we can optimise the systems. And we also apply similar techniques to the, the buffers and things like that, where we can design them for the different types of impacts. So where next? Um, this was an interesting one. So I thought, well, I can't come in and not ask any questions before you start asking me questions. I'll get one over first. So first thing is, um, we need to recognise that we have to continually challenge current practices. You know, we're all engineers and to be honest, there's a lot required. The industry is still working with fairly antiquated uh, facilities and practices and there's a long way to go, both on a lean sense and also with the machinery we're using and the whole thinking. And I think the stuff that Cynthia was talking about earlier on just shows you what we can do if you get some good people involved and start to think a little bit differently about it and put some pace into it. We need to look at things like, um, should we build flat? You know, we're building uh, flat at the moment, putting on a flat uh, tilting wagon. Um, I guess when you get to a point, at what point do you say, should we recreate the geometry of the site we're going to go, the panels are going to go into, so everything the torrent to the right when it actually gets assembled? And I don't know, I've not checked the, the figures out, but I imagine there might come a point where we need that absolute certainty that we might need our assembly yards not to be flat, but they might need to articulate in some way. And if they do, then we need to know now so we can actually plan for that as we're putting our investment plans in. We also need to look at, can we ever get the confidence that we can build single panels? At the moment, we're sort of <coughs> we're farming S and C. You can see the uh, facilities, we saw the banner outside. We've got a huge pad at Beeston for laying stuff out so people can see it and see it works. But the question then is, should we be doing that when we go modular? Or should we be producing single panels like we've seen being produced on the continent or in, like we do in the States, if Progress Road in the States produce them in single panels, send them out to site and then they, it fits when it gets there. So we need to see how do we do that? How do we prove to people we can do that repeatedly to get the confidence for people to trust that it will arrive right at the other end? Inspectors can be quite fickle. They, they've got their own individual uh, preferences some like streamlines, some like lasers, some like whatever. So is there a, a way we can actually think about standardising that by having someone permanently there who's, who basically checks everything or is guarantee everything before it arrives? Or would you trust us to do that? But um, at the moment, it feels like sometimes that is a little bit cronky in the way it's working at the moment. <coughs> Building information modelling, BIM. Um, in aerospace, we had a thing called uh, product data management, and we had things called key systems for designing and developing the components. Uh, we did them in the 90s, and 
the construction industry is now coming ahead with this uh, target for 2016 to have BIM. And we need to understand what BIM means to manufacturers. And we think we know what it means, but we need to make sure we do, because we don't want to get to 2016 and find out we've, uh, we've been aiming for the wrong target. So now's the time to start, because we've only got, uh, well, <laughs> not long left, let's put it that way. But it takes time to put IT systems in and all the other things. So what is the industry standard for BIM? How does it apply to manufacturing? And then we need to model the whole system. So sometimes I wonder who's got that overall system, the handling system, uh, logistics system, everything. Who's got that model in their head? Uh, when we were on watching the uh, switch and crossing, the team that was there pulled it together and owned the system. But where is that now? Where is the ownership that keeps that going and retains that factory built integrity? Steve came to our site, uh, Steve Ferguson came to our site a few months ago and was leaving me about the handling equipment we were using. And uh, when we sort of dug into that, it wasn't as clear as I think we all thought about what systems we should be using. And that we need that clarity. We need to know what beams are we supposed to be using, how do we handle it, and just we need that certainty. There's no need for not having it. But we also want to know what do you want from S&C supplies. Now, if we're a business that wants to grow, that wants to expand, but what do you want? What do you want from us as S&C suppliers? And what shape do you want us? Because we've got ambitions. We're all engineers who enjoy doing this stuff. Otherwise, we go and do something else. So what do you want from us? So just reiterating, what I tried to do here was to say what we do, broad terms, show you some pictures and videos of that, how we do it, and ask some questions for the future. And that's my slot. Thank you.